Hello and welcome to this episode of the Star Wars Universe podcast. Today we're talking about a character, a character who I have always been both loved and frustrated by because I think there was so much of his story that could have been told. And today we're going to dive into his story from both the movies and the shows, also the books from both canon and legends, and talk about what could have been done with a story that wasn't. We're talking, of course, about the fallen Jedi, the Sith Lord, Darth Tyrannus, a.k.a. Count Dooku. And we're doing that with myself, Paul Hoppy, and Star Wars knowledge extraordinaire Jonah Kelman. All that more after a commercial break that probably the Sith have control over, but I just don't want to use my Force powers today. Welcome back. I'm your host, I'm Matthew, is they, them pronouns. I'm Paul Hoppy, the resident guest. I use they, them pronouns. <laughs> and uh, we're going to do an introduction, right? Of the, or you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're, okay. you're, our, you're like the you're norm, basically. Right. Like, you <laughs> don't run the bar, <laughs> exactly. but you're always at the bar. Yes. <laughs> I think that's fitting. Uh, we do have a special guest. Uh, he's been on our podcast a couple times before. Uh, always very happy to have him on to talk about Star Wars and some other topics, but... Uh, I've been learning a lot more about the Legends canon and some other parts of earlier Star Wars by talking to Jonah Kelman. Um, he's been a good friend, a great guest. I'm really glad to have him on. Jonah, say hello. Hi, I'm Jonah, and I like Star Wars just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> Is there a book in the Legends canon you don't own? Um, that is a difficult question to answer. So I don't own probably about two-thirds of the comic books. I own all of the novels. I don't know, own any of the young adult books. There is technically a novel that I lent out to a friend that I think is lost, and so I no longer own it nor have possession of it. Mm. But I have... There's a shelf behind me that has pretty much all of them on there, plus nice. some other books that aren't from the novels, like reference books and that sort of thing. And I should say, uh, for those of you who want to, we're going to talk a little bit about the Legends canon today, as well as the canon canon, a um, whole artillery set of canons the today. Disney canon. It's yeah, yeah, Disney Disney. Canon. thank you. Yes, I was thinking <laughs> it. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> That's not a way to say it. Look, on Wikipedia, which, Wikipedia, which I think is the most canonical of all, they call it the canon and then Legends. But you're right. Disney canon and Legends canon. That's a better way to use it. Uh, the point, though, being... If you're interested in learning more about Legends, uh, Jonah does a great podcast called The Archives Are Incomplete. Clearly, he's referring to the fact that one of his books has been loaned out and <laughs> yes. hasn't been given back. Uh, but yeah, it's a great podcast. Um, if you really want to learn more about the Legends without necessarily reading all the books, definitely check out that podcast. Or if you have read the books, check out the podcast. Most but, of the episodes are shorter than reading the books. Yes. <laughs> Most. Most. <laughs> no, but uh, honestly... With some exceptions, I think in a lot of cases your your uh, your explanations are a lot better than the books as well. So the exceptions being when the books are quite good, not that your explanations yes. are ever not good. There are some um, quite good books. Yes, uh, but let's talk today about Count Dooku. Let me just kind of open up first. Like, what's your general thoughts on this character? He's fascinating and not a real Sith. That's my hmm. take. Interesting. Okay, we'll get more to that. Paul, what about you? I. I'm interested to hear more about that. I, I find him a very interesting <laughs> character who is, you get a lot of sort of implications of who he might be in the media mm -hmm. I've seen, which is really, um, you know, the, the movies and the animation. Uh, but I feel like you don't get ever, you don't ever get like a full backstory. There's not like a, here's a Count Dooku origin story episode or where he's going to like really go into depth talking about some things. But there is, I feel, always a sense that there's something beneath the surf surface there and that he's like a mm -hmm. real person. Also, I just, I think Christopher Lee was one of the best things in Attack of the Clones, you know, and, yeah. um, and just gave a great performance for a character that I think in the movies didn't get even as much depth as there was in, in the uh, Clone Wars animated series. Um, but yeah. still, there was, you know, there's just, there's presence, you know, with Christopher yeah. Lee. And I think that really makes the character work, even when the writing for me isn't, you know, my favorite writing. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And I think I, I would agree with both of those. I would say, as probably Joan and I are going to talk about a good deal, the books, I think, fill in a lot more of that story that mm -hmm. you're talking about. And I wish... We'd gotten a couple of episodes, maybe of Clone Wars, that did that as well. Um, I will say that uh, Dooku is one of the few characters where 
for the most part, I enjoy the legend stuff, but I am, for the most part, much more beholden to the Disney stories. As we'll talk about, I think actually the Legends version of his fall makes a lot more sense than the Disney version, and and we'll talk about that. For me, though, mostly he's my character's biggest frustration, and and part of that, and I've ranted about this before, I won't go into much detail, but to me, the single worst moment that happens on screen in Star Wars in a moment that's not created by J.J. Abrams mm-hmm. is where Darth Tyrannus, um, Count Dooku gets off that shuttle and shows that he's working with uh, Darth Sidious. Because to me, I thought the idea of this person who's independently believing in the Separatists, believing in these causes, and Sidious is manipulating him without knowing him, is a much more interesting story than what that gave us. And so I'm excited to kind of dive into the character and talk about um, what he is, but also what he could have been. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, how, I, how so? I'm going to, can I deviate from the plan immediately? Sure, go for it. Great. So, I, I mean, we're, we were going to get to this eventually, but I don't know if, um, Dooku was so much under the command of Sidious or, I mean, he was manipulated by Sidious, absolutely. Right. But I think he is, the reason he follows Sidious, the reason he goes to Sidious in Attack of the Clones is because of his belief in the Separatist movement and not because of his belief in Sidious. This is one of the reasons why I say he's not a true Sith. He's following Sidious because it support, it's a means to the end of supporting the Separatist movement rather than following oh. the Separatist movement because he's a Sith. See, that's interesting because the, the clear impression that I got from that scene at the end of, of Clone Wars which, granted, is not, as has been pointed out, perhaps not the most precise writing, so it's possible that some things are up for interpretation. But also, what I, what I thought I had had confirmed in both Legends and Disney canon in some of the books is that from the, the point is that from the beginning, he, uh, Dooku knows that the point is to start a war between the Separatists and the Republic that both sides will lose so that the Sith can take over. Because um, that the interpretation you're giving is one I would have liked a lot more. Yeah. But to me, that scene in Clone, the uh, Attack of the Clones, and I rewatched it two nights ago, and and still that's how what I walk away feeling like, especially because in both versions, he is very involved through Sifo Dyas with the creation of the droid, the droid, the Republic Army, so which is standing directly against the the Separatists. It's been a while since I've seen Attack of the Clones. I'm not going to uh-huh. say how long it's been too long. Um, but my interpretation... You're not missing much. <laughs> I Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen any of the movies. Anyways, mm-hmm. my interpretation is that it's... He is more of a believer in the Separatist actions, and he believes that a war with the Republic is inevitable because they have to overthrow the Republic to establish Separatist rule. And... Right. They're putting the Sith in charge because they, and particularly he himself more so than even Sidious, know how to rule the galaxy better. Right. Um, what, so, would, what would Separatist rule be? Like, um, isn't that almost like an oxymoron in a way? So, he doesn't actually want the Separatists to win. He wants the Sith to win, and by the Sith, uh, he means himself. Right. Um, right. And he okay, does well, believe in the Sith tenant of overthrowing his master and then he's the emperor and right. he fixes the galaxy right he's right. a samaritan okay so so that is what i meant because mm, it's I'm, complicated i'm tempted here to dive right in Let, let's put this conversation okay. on hold and sort of go through some <laughs> of the rest of it because i i think what you just said we're actually much more in agreement than it might have seemed at the beginning okay yeah, yeah. now i just uh, want to oh. watch daredevil and the whole thing with the <laughs> ill intent i am the ill intent and, and oh. yes yes that's so good yeah i god i never really realized it but you're right kingpin is a sith I oh yeah, that way. <laughs> I mean. or, no, what he is—he's a shadow from B- Babylon Five, which many people okay, won't get that okay, reference, okay. and I apologize, <laughs> but fair enough. It's on my list um, to watch. It's very good, very good, uh, very dated, yeah. very, very dated, but still very good. Uh, all right, let's look. So let's talk about uh, the character himself. Uh, and first, let's start with kind of general impressions. What do you like about Dooku? What do you find interesting about this character, Paul? Let's start with you. Um, I mean, I like that he seems to have a viewpoint and I, I'm not sure how much the, 
movies and the the TV show or shows like really make clear what his true motivation is, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of like whether there's like a real textual like this is what he wants in in Attack of right. the Clones or Revenge of the Sith. I I can see him kind of like I can see that he wants to take over from Palpatine, right? Like that's in that Sith way. But at the same time, he, he kind of feels like I don't know, the fact that he used to be a Jedi as opposed to someone who was just like a Sith and was a Sith the whole time, right. you know. The fact that he used to be a Jedi and it doesn't seem in the movies or like or the TV show in the in the Clone Wars, like that he like did something bad and then turned to the dark side. You know, it felt more like it felt like he had more agency in it um than in some ways it feels like anakin had you know and like it was less about temptation and it was more about choice which um Mm -hmm. which i enjoy in a character most of the time you know i mean anakin vader is one of my favorite characters in like fiction right but i do like having this character who's like this is what he wanted to do it seems like you know and it's because he saw you know the the jedi way is like not really doing what he wanted to be done and like maybe not doing what it set out to be doing right and so mm-hmm. i think i i think he's a very interesting idea for a character that isn't ever quite fully explored in um you know in the the motion pictures and <laughs> you know animated um series as much as i would enjoy but like also just he's just kind of I don't know, charismatic and fun and convincing. And, um, you know, the the emperor, I think, makes a good foil in terms of just like, yep, yep, they're evil, you know. (laughs) And it it makes it really easy to kind of see sort of the light in the dark. But, like, a character like Dooku, I feel like, adds a little more depth. And, like, you'd get a very different story if, like, what if Dooku did overthrow Palpatine and then right. and then took over the galaxy? Like, what what kind of story would that be? That would be a very different story, I think. Yeah, Jonah, what about you? What do you like about the character? He's fascinating because he comes from a very different background than many other Jedi. Um, mm-hmm. He has a connection to his background. Actually, the title Count Dooku is because he's a noble from the planet Sereno. Now. I promise I'm going to keep the deep cuts to a minimum, <laughs> but my one deep cut that I need to get in here. 3,000 years before all of this, um, during the time of Darth Bane, uh, Supreme Chancellor Valorum... Uh, different... uh, Darth Bane, by the way, for those who aren't playing our home game, is the founder of the modern idea of the yeah. Sith, the, the rule of two. Yeah. So Supreme Chancellor Valorum, who is the first non-Jedi Supreme Chancellor, and the direct... Uh, ancestor to Finnis Valorum, who Palpatine overthrows and Fin Menace. Um, anyways, he goes to Sereno because there is a separatist movement there. And in Darth Bane's time, he actually prevents the separatist movement from succeeding, led by somebody from nobles from Sereno, because it's not the time for the Sith to rise up. And so there's this beautiful little symmetry that 3,000 years later the Separatists do finally bubble over and do begin this galactic uprising, and they are led by a noble from Sereno. In any case, that's enough of that deep cut. Um, He remains true to his roots. He is aristocratic and a negotiator throughout. Uh, You Mm -hmm. see in the books and the movies and the shows... He does when he gets his hands on a Jedi or is interacting with a Jedi, he is more likely to start with a conversation than by drawing his blade. You see Asajj yeah. Ventress or Maul or Vader. The first thing they do when they see a green or blue lightsaber or somebody carrying a lightsaber is they're like, Alright, we're fighting now. And Dooku's like, Let's talk. Because I'm <laughs> smarter than you, and I bet you I can convince you that I'm right. One of the few scenes in Attack of the Clones that I really like is where he is talking to Obi-Wan. And at least for the first part of that conversation, he sounds quite reasonable. And like yeah. he's saying, like, Obi-Wan, there's real problems and I want you to see them with me. And then he goes into mustache twirling land because of bad writing. But yeah, that, I love that part of Dooku. Right. And um, in 
the Clone Wars TV show, he's imprisoned with, I believe, both Anakin and Obi Wan, or just Correct, yeah. Obi Wan. No, and both like, of them at one point. Both of them, and he's like, okay, let's work together. Like, I don't want to. This is disgusting and humiliating, but I'm smarter than you. I can, I can plot my way out of this. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the interactions between Hondo and Naka and uh, Count Dooku, you know, early Clone Wars are some of my favorite. Like, yeah. I, that, I think those are the first Count uh, Hondo and Naka episodes we get, and they're yeah. so good. In part because, like, ha- Hondo and Naka is basically the Jack Sparrow of Star Wars. Like, without the raving sexuality, but, like, although some people may feel differently about that. But, like, it, it, that same kind of, like, playful, nothing is serious, everything is about the next score, everything is whatever... And Count Dooku is such a perfect foil to that because he is so aristocratic and so proper. And so, you know, I'm going to defeat you through proper duel- duelsmanship. <laughs> yeah. He but has like, that signature look of superiority. Yeah. Like, he's got this, like, I have this dignity. And um, and Hondo d- does not. But at the same time, they have this thing in common where they're both, like, trying to outmaneuver and outthink the other. And so, the, right. you know, I think they have this great similarity and then this great contrast at the same time. And that often... I think is a really great pairing for characters. This is a smaller cut, but I want to go back to your comment about proper dueling. Um, Mm -hmm. Count Dooku's lightsaber handle is distinctly curved, which is unique. And it actually allows him to adopt a fighting style that is more similar to traditional fencing than to um, the Eastern fighting style that is most other lightsaber combat. And so he has what most Westerners would see as Mm. a proper dueling posture when he's in combat and he also doesn't take part in a lot of acrobatics he's very straightforward with his combat which is interesting to see and and my my understanding is that some some of that may well be how the character was written some of that was because christopher lee was like look i've been doing this for 40 years a i know how to sword fight and that's how i'm gonna sword fight But also, he didn't want stunt doubles, so he didn't mm. want, like, some younger person flipping and flapping yeah. all around. He was like, no, I'm going to do the things that I'm in my 60s or 70s, or so that's what I even. can do. Yeah, yeah but I, I don't think he's that old, but it's possible. Um, but, yeah, and so I, I, I love that it's both the, like, you know, so much of that I think was sh- – like, I think Christopher Lee specifically requested that style of, of sword, the curved yeah. handle and the like. Uh, and I love that he himself put so much into the character. It, it makes much stronger characters. Yeah. Yeah. He was 80 the year that that movie came out. So he was like 79 wow. when they filmed it or 78 or something. It, is, is, that, is he he's still alive, isn't he? No, he's, he'd be one no, of those he, hundreds he died right now. At, at, in 2015 when he was like okay. his late or early 90s, 97, yeah. something like that, um, 93. But yeah, he was like recording metal albums like into his 90s. Yeah. Like as a vocalist. Huh. <laughs> you know, I mean. The, I mean, we could. Do we just want to talk about Christopher Lee for the next hour? Because there no, are stories. So I, I want to tell one quick story, and if someone else wants to just tell a story, great, and then we'll cut off the tangent. Okay. But I, one of my personal favorites is that apparently at some point while making the movie, <clears throat> I don't remember if this was Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, but it was one of those two. They were making the movie, and there was some discussion about like what's the sound that a blade makes when it enters the human body. And because he'd been a commando in World War II... Yeah. He was able to be like, this is what it sounds like. Oh. And either Peter Jackson or George Lucas was like, yeah. well, how do you... He's like, I, I, know. I know. Trust right, me. Right, right. That was, uh, I think, Lord of the Rings, because it's right. when Gandalf stabs him. And yes, I think Peter Jackson right. was like, make more of a blah sound. And Christopher was like, that is not how it sounds like when you're stabbed there. Like, if I was being stabbed here, sure, that would make sense. <laughs> uh, yeah. The... It, it's both great stories, but also, again, is like, oh, you're, how could this great actor be so wasted with, like, j- I'm sorry, just one other thing on this, and then, Joan, I want you to tell yeah. your story, but, like, he has that aura of, like, gentlemanliness and, like, I want to have a proper duel. And so for that aura to be expressed as Yoda, it seems we cannot overcome our, each other through our force abilities. We must settle this in the ancient way of a lightsaber. It's just, like... Right. I, the idea is beautiful, and those words are so bad. Yeah, yeah. You just needed you needed someone to punch up the script and just yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. My anyway, Jonah, Christopher Lee, Lee, Christopher Lee tangent is that he because of his actions in World War II, he was the inspiration for his cousin writing 
Ian Fleming writing James Bond. Yes, uh, also true. That's also amazing. Your comment about his distinguished combat style, I would have loved to see Christopher Lee as Dooku versus Alec Guinness as Obi-Wan. Oh. That would have oh, been yeah. <laughs> such a beautiful, stately duel. Yes. That would have been amazing. Anyways, back to Count Dooku, the character. Yeah. So, I think especially because Paul brought this up, um, I, I don't want to go too deep into it. So, Jonah, I'm going to try telling the story, but you can fill in some of the details. I'll restrain uh, myself. In, yeah, in part because I, I, I assume you'll need to correct me a bit, but also because I trust myself a little bit to summarize. <laughs> um, with no offense meant. Because... Paul, you brought up the really the story of like why don't we know more about like what caused him to fall, and to me, and I think we get this like hints of it in the shows and the movies, but it's much more in the books, and it's told differently in Disney canon versus Legends canon. I'll get into that difference later, but I think to me the most essential part of it is that he is, um, as a Jedi, he is very involved in with the Jedi. He's a Jedi Master. He serves on the Council. He's the um, Master to his Padawan Qui Gon Jinn. And he has very strong feelings about the fact that the Jedi are becoming too involved in the poly- in the sort of petty squabbles of the Republic and of all of this kind of thing. And part of why I prefer Legends is that I think Legends does a much better job of explaining this. But 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 in both cases, I th- the way it plays out is, and this is kind of getting to what you were saying, Paul. He becomes deeply he becomes deeply dissatisfied with the Jedi. And decides to leave the Jedi. And then his fall to the dark side comes, at least in Legends, significantly later. Mm. At that at that point, he's starting to flirt with the idea that maybe he could still do what is right and good and use a few dark side powers along the way in a kind of like maybe we don't have to like, you know, fight with our right arm be- tied behind our back. But it's that he does he does break and that. One of the things I love, the Legends canon, the, the biggest difference I think here is that in Legends canon, the thing that causes him to leave is the death of Qui-Gon Jinn. Because mm. there's already been a couple of other times where because of like Republic bureaucratic squabbling, Jedi's got sent in to deal with problems that he thinks the Jedi shouldn't have been sent into and Jedi got killed, which he hates. And then when Qui-Gon Jinn, who is his like, you know, beloved Padawan, um, does that for him, that's the final straw and he leaves. In the Disney canon, which I think is best told through the book Jedi Dooku Lost, but is also told quite well in Apprentice, um, and a little bit through Brotherhood, actually more so in the book Brotherhood, um, it th- he goes back to Serrano at one point and gets into this fight with people who are trying to help take over Serrano and uses some dark side powers in that fight and decides to leave the Jedi to take care of uh, Serrano instead, but that's a good five or seven years before Qui-Gon Jinn dies. Um, and so that's one place where I definitely like the legend story a lot more. But I think in either case, kind of the, the key points to me are that it is his frustration with the Jedi, his, his I think quite rightly so, feeling that like the Jedi are becoming manipulated by the, by the Republic, that he is sent, he's very into prophecy, and so he believes that a darkness is coming and the Jedi are not doing enough about it. And that it's, oh, like, as he leaves, he starts being like, I wish there was people who... who got what I was thinking of. And that's when Sidious Palpatine finds him and starts talking to him. Jonah, how is that as a, a basic summary? Uh, Painting over, brushing over a lot of the broad details. Yeah, that's generally, I generally agree with that. I think a large part of it is not just disillusionment with the Jedi and how they are becoming to a degree lap dogs for the Republic, but also that the Republic itself has become so monolithic and corrupt that yeah. the best way to fix the problem is to burn down the galaxy and start from scratch. Mm. Yeah. But other than that, yeah. I mean, in Legends canon, he does have another apprentice, Kamari Fosa, uh, who does fall to the dark side before he leaves the Jedi Order. And that's another part of the tipping point. Um, right. And again, as a specialist in the Legends canon... Uh, if you don't mind me going just a little bit deeper. Yeah, go for it. Um, go for it. Part of what starts the push is he's, in. if I remember correctly, he's invited to uh, not quite a party, but a gathering. I guess a party is correct. By um, a banker who mm-hmm. 
sometimes goes by the name Darth Plagueis. Generally, he doesn't go by that name. He generally... Uh, Hugo <laughs> Damask. Hugo Damask, yes. Uh, and at that party, Hugo talks to him and is like, Hey, do you want to see something that's really messed up? Like, I have senators who are eating out of the palm of my hand. The Republic is in danger and their whispers of these organizations that are building up their armies and he's talking to cypher at the same time he's like what happens if there's an army that rises up against the republic what happens to the republic then do the jedi get sent out to be the front lines and count dooku's like god no i don't want that to happen and that's what starts dooku and cypher on the creation of the clone army and it also makes dooku really see how powerful the corruption is a merchant can just go to a jedi and say yeah i can buy senators Mm -hmm. do you think this is a problem and the jedi's like yes you should not like this is not freedom this is not democracy if one person can just control the government by spending money that's a problem is the implication that there are political systems where that's not the case um (laughs) I think the implication is that there was a point in time where that was not the case in the Republic. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I think the point you're making is very valid. Yeah. That, like, on one level, I do think we're supposed to believe that the corruption in the Republic at the time of these stories happening is both more pronounced but also probably more public. But I think, and in a very obvious play to our own world, that there is probably some extent to which people like Dooku – have this like romanticized mm. idea yeah. of back in the good old days, everyone in the Senate was good and uprighteous and pure, and I wish we could go back to that, which, you know, again, which, that's a pretty believable story, given it happens all the time. Right. part of it is also that it's, what if the Jedi were in charge? The Jedi are right. inherent, they are guided by the light side of the Force. They are incorruptible. They, like, when the Jedi ruled the Republic... The only threat was the Sith, really. The Jedi knew what was right because they had the Force telling them. And Dooku's like, yeah, why don't we go back to the good old days when I was in charge? (laughs) I know better. Right. And I will say that that is uh, the High Republic books, which are part of the Disney canon. So I know, Jonah, you haven't read them. But they're actually doing an interesting exploration of that because part of what they're exploring is that as of only about 200 years ago it had been fairly common for the Jedi to have a much more powerful role. And that part of what those books are about is the time period when the Republic is kind of starting to assert itself a lot more as having control over the Jedi. I I, I think to me, this is going to be a weird metaphor, but... Oh, boy. uh, No, this isn't my Anakin-needed sex ed one, although I'm going to that one later, which I do believe literally, but I also mean as a metaphor, which I'll, I'll explain at some other time. I think, though, that um, Dooku is the Duke. Like, if Anakin's the problem when you don't have good sex ed, and I mean that metaphorically, but also literally, Dooku is the problem with the just say no to drugs. You know, the, the, ju- the, the just say no to, to all drugs are bad, all drugs are awful. The reason why that's been proven to be ridiculously unhelpful again and again is that, you know, like, when you tell kids that the first time they do drugs, their face will fall off and they'll die. Mm. And then they smoke pot once and nothing really bad happens. You now make them not believe any of the warnings that you've had. And, like, this has been very well documented as a problem and part of why that's not the method a lot of drug education uses anymore. Dooku, I think, and I, and I see this much more in uh, Disney. And so, Jonah, tell me if you don't see this in Legends. But especially in the book that I just read, uh, Dooku Jedi Lost, which I think is a very good book. It, it's an audio book and what you can read is the script of it. Um, and it kind of which they'd made it as kind of like like what DC does is like an animated movie because I think it would have been fantastic. It's a very interesting story. But part of what you see is that Dooku has been taught never, ever touch the, the dark side, never do anything with the dark side. And then there are a couple of times where he does lose control of his emotions a bit, in part because he's kept his connection with his sister throughout this whole time that he was a Padawan and thus has some emotional attachment issues. And so when she's in danger, he has some strong emotions and he winds up like using force lightning and stuff like that. And his face doesn't fall off and he doesn't Mm -hmm. die. You know, he doesn't become a mindless Sith automatically. And that's a big part of why he's like, well, then maybe 
all the stuff they told me about the dark side being the most evil evil that's ever eviled isn't true. And maybe I can be a good Jedi who does the right things, but force lightnings my opponents when they deserve it. Um, and I, I, I really like that, that kind of idea of it. Uh, Jonah, you're making a face. So I think that maybe that your, your view of legends is very different in this regard. Yeah. I don't think that's quite how he's portrayed in legends canon. Um, yeah. And to be clear, I'm not saying he was, I'm right. just saying that's in the Disney canon. Yeah. In the legends canon, it's more of a position of his fiscal and like political beliefs. That's what drives him to leave the Jedi Order. Um, he's right. just like this galaxy is not being run correctly. Neither the Jedi nor the Republic will fix it. I will go be an independent and be a knight errant and solve all of the galaxy's problems. Right. Um, Although he does have the line to. Um... I think he, I think he thinks he's talking just to Chancellor Palpatine towards the end of Darth Plagueis, where he sort of says like, you know, and maybe oh, one yeah. of the things that the Jedi are wrong about is this idea that you can never use dark side powers. Oh, and absolutely. He, he sort of says that maybe you can use some of those powers without necessarily having your soul corrupted. You know, the, the first time you try cocaine. I mean, he is of the belief that there are essentially no wrong actions, just wrong outcomes. Mm hmm. Um. Which is somewhat supported by how the Republic acts and how the Jedi act. Because they are doing right actions, but getting bad outcomes. And he's like, clearly this is an untrue statement that there are only right actions. Right. Um, I mean, one thing, this is going to go even deeper into legend stuff. And so here I, I'm giving you permission to do a deep cut. Oh boy. Um. I understand why something like mind control is thought of as a dark side power or even force choking. But like, because to me that often is more about like torture. But like, you're in a battle. You, maybe as a Jedi you're not supposed to start the battle. But like if people are trying to kill you and kill civilians and you have to kill them, you're allowed to kill them. Why is it okay to slice them down with your laser sword but not to shoot lightning out of your fingers? Like what, what is it that makes force lightning an inherently dark side power? So, uh, needle pulling thread. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is a weird question to answer because there is, um, there are some Jedi who are like, nah, you can use the dark side and it's about your emotional state and the power required, essentially. Uh, mm. in most people, the amount of power you need to channel the force to summon lightning is immense. And to get to that level of power, you need to tap into the dark side or be very powerful. However, there is a Jedi. I can't remember if it was... Ah, yes. Um, there's an ability called Electric Judgment. Uh, Plo Koon uh, was a light side force user, member of the Jedi Council, and somebody who used force lightning um and he used interesting he fired out lightning from his hands using the light side as a form of judgment um that sounds pretty dark side <laughs> but I, I i hear what you're saying i mean it's this is something that came up in the republic commando series um mm -hmm. this is gonna be a little bit spoilers for the second book in that series triple zero uh, the Jedi Knight Attain Termu Khan is asked to, or is not asked, but volunteers to interrogate a prisoner after he's been tortured for a couple of days. He has been tortured and resisted an expert torturer's ministrations. And she's like, we're not getting anywhere with this. I can do better. And so she, she goes into his mind and figures out what his deepest fears are and figures out why he believes in the cause that he believes in and why he isn't breaking and then she just snaps the twig at the bottom of the scaffolding and all of his beliefs crumble and so she just gives him a crisis of faith permanently and then she's like that seems more screwed up than torturing him but also torturing him was screwed up and we needed this so that we could save lives where is the line I did it 
without feeling any ill will or hatred or malice. I felt no emotion at all because that was what I was trained to do. This is problematic. Uh, yeah, that's some Professor X level of like, no, I'm doing this for the greater good kind of nonsense. I mean, I mean sometimes she does... maybe you are, though, but okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got a long fair. mind control rant that I'll spare you. Yeah, I also mean, fair. what's interesting is, I mean, Jedi all over the place use mind control. I mean, you see yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi yeah. left and right being like, these are not the droids you're looking for. You don't, you want to stop smoking just left and right. He's like, I can solve problems by fixing, changing people's minds. And that's probably not a good thing. Um, but it's to the Jedi and to the Force to a degree, it's what the intent is behind the action. How do you feel? If you are feeling mm. anger or hatred and that is what's giving you the power to use Force Lightning, that's dark side. If you are emotionless when you're killing people, that's great. Okay. Right. That, so that actually well, makes a lot of sense. That 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 force lightning is, is it's a symptom. It's not yeah. the cause necessarily. Yeah. I'm sorry, Paul, you haven't said anything in a while. Yeah, basically it's like the source of the power. That's the question. Yeah. It's not the effect right. of the power, right? And it's just yeah. that generally the source of these powers that are thought of as dark side powers are like it's a dark source. It's like anger. It's it's uh, rage, right? It's yeah, right. fear or whatever. But like when when it's like no, I I I want I want to caress you with the lightning, like then then mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be. I guess that's some people are into that. But like yeah, and I will say at least in the stuff that I've read, especially from Disney, when Dooku taps into lightning, it's always when he is very emotional. Mm. Um, also, almost all like. I want Sifo Dias to get his own book at some point because, at least in the stuff I've read, Sifo Dias is basically the Ron Weasley to Dooku. Like, he's just kind of like the, wow, Dooku, that was so cool. <laughs> or, Dooku, we shouldn't be. Like, he's just. Really? He's a lovable character, but he's, al- he's also always the one getting injured when Dooku loses control mm. a little bit. Um, but, he al- but I will say one of the things is that he also goes very deep into. He's often the source of the prophecies. That um, And this is actually one of the things I think is interesting, again, in how it sets things up. He is constantly having prophecies that the Jedi Council refuses to pay attention to, which I think kind of helps just like – so you can understand how Dooku having this um, best friend who has these prophecies that could warn people of terrible disasters but the Jedi won't listen, that that person could wind up training someone like Qui-Gon Jinn – who does pay a lot of attention to prophecy, even mm. when the Jedi Council tells him not to. Right. And then, I mean, it's funny if you're the one who has these prophecies about bad things happening, and then you're the one who makes the bad things happen. Yes. You also. know, <laughs> I mean, he, crea- he he was responsible for the clone army, right? Which, whether that's, I mean, I don't know. It, that within, I'll say within the context of the TV show, that is very weird. It feels very weird. It feels like they right. get to the bottom of this, and, and I guess in Attack of the Clones also some, right? But, like, I don't feel like it ends up all, like, making all of the sense. Like, that that whole so backstory. I imagine that there's some more context that you get outside mm-hmm. of those. Yeah. Um, the context that I want to pull in is, again, Legends Canon from the book Darth Plagueis, where at the party where he was talking with Dooku... They also talk with sifo and they're like, why doesn't the Republic have a way to defend itself? Mm-hmm. Um, piracy is getting more rampant. The Trade Federation is arming more ships, and they are disagreeing with your regulations, and so they might come after your regulations next. And so there is this outside pressure of maybe the Republic should have an army, and Plagueis is the one who's like, I mean, if you need money to defend the Republic, I believe in the cause of the Republic. <laughs> I'd be happy to ship you trillions upon trillions of credit to build a navy that can fight off the Trade Federation and the Commerce Guild and all of the economic powerhouses of the galaxy because I'm their equal individually. <laughs> right. And and that's where I think... Um, I mean, we're kind of bouncing around with the topics, but I think it's good because we're, we're, we're basically talking about everything I wanted us to talk about. I think that's where I would say this is the version of the story that – because I I think you're right, Jonah, in both these versions of the story, but especially when we get on screen, what he wants is these two sides to fight each other so that everything will be torn down and he can then emerge or the Sith can then emerge to take over and rebuild the galaxy with eventually Dooku taking over from Palpatine and being in charge of everything. That's what Dooku wants, you think? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think I would have liked what I would have been very much. I think what I, I think the story that I would have liked a lot more, and maybe Paul, this is kind of speaking to what you're talking about, in all that makes sense, is one where Dooku has nothing to do with building the droid army. Dooku, his goal, it, he believes the world will be better. Like, it, it's interesting actually that there's a later novel called Bloodlines which is about Leia kind of working in the um, political world of the Repu of the New Republic maybe 15 years after the um, uh, Return of the Jedi. And one of the things that comes up in that is that there's these two groups, one of which that wants more centralized power and one of which that wants more uh, like federalized, diversified power. And that, that second group often says they want something similar to the separatists. So mm. they're kind of... And it's basically the idea of kind of like that there is a central government to the Republic, but that the... The, the individual worlds are left alone to do what they want much more so. Right. And, and that's kind of an aside. Um, but to me, I, I think a Dooku who honestly believed in that, who honestly believed that the Republic was corrupt, the Jedi were corrupt, and he thought that, like, you know, planets should have the right to go off on their own and do their own thing, and he wanted to support that, and he was happy to fight the Jedi in doing so. I think that would have been a much more interesting character than the one who's sort of, in, you know, because, like, we know Plagueis is in on it from the beginning. I would have loved to have someone who wasn't, who honestly believed in the Separatist cause and was, you know, had some legitimate points but was being manipulated by Sidious. And who, like, honestly and clearly was of that motivation, right? Because it sounds like, right. Jonah, you think that actually kind of is yeah. where he's coming from. But, but I, I will say that that's definitely not clear, in, yeah, in oh, the absolutely. media that I've seen, at least. You know? yeah. Like, I think you have to go a little bit deeper to get my interpretation. And, I like, my interpretation is he honestly believes in the Separatist movement and the best way to be a, in a position of power is he just goes to the Sith running the thing and is like, hey, I'm a Jedi Master. You want me to be your apprentice so I can be second in command of this whole thing. Right. And then I kick you off and I'm in charge and I right. can save the galaxy also it's a quick very quick aside when you mentioned bloodline mm -hmm. uh -huh, it is a novel written by claudia gray there's also bloodlines <laughs> mm. which is a novel in the legends canon and it's actually set probably at a very similar time okay no it's a decade later uh, uh, okay yeah the same but, you know general yeah. you know phase yeah. Of some yeah yeah. During the also, New Republic, but yeah, no, and I hear I, I think I think Jonah, where I where I'm the thing that I think what I've changed from your interpretation is I I get that he as you're saying he did support the separatist cause, but he he wanted there to be this cataclysmic war between the separatists and the republic that in which kind of both sides would lose so that it would all fall apart. And I'm saying that's the part that I wish hadn't happened. That it was just that he did like he had nothing to do with creating the the clone army. He 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 would have been happy if the Republic didn't try to fight a war with them, if they could just split off and be doing their own thing. I don't like that, because um, mm. I feel like the Separatist position is relatively indefensible, because the Separatist position is we shouldn't have any economic regulation. Uh, and that's not what Dooku wants. I, that's not what any sane person, I think, wants. Um and so, like, somebody who's just like, yeah, I absolutely believe that these massive corporations should be allowed to do whatever they want doesn't jive with me as well, because I, what I, I like mean, about Dooku's I mean, libertarians approach, do exist in our own world. Like, Yeah, I said something about sanity, right? <laughs> um, what Dooku's looking for... Dooku still is trying to do the right thing. Dooku right. isn't... The reason I said Dooku isn't a true Sith at the top of the show is because he's not doing this for selfish reasons. He's like, yeah, I want to be in charge of the galaxy so that I can help everyone else. Um, he's like, I think that the galaxy is an unjust and unfair place and everybody else is just making things worse. I can't make things worse than anybody else's, so might as well put me in charge. Yeah, I guess I maybe mean, we just see it differently because I, I, I don't. I think there's a couple times where some of the books tell us that's what he feels, but to me that doesn't fit with particularly the way he partners with Sidious. You know, means like, to an end. 
Because, mm. again, he does he's not about right action, he's about right outcome, which is more towards the dark side. But again, my interpretation. Right. Paul, what about you? What what what, what would you have liked to see to, to, to improve the dark... You also talked about feeling the character was underutilized. What would you have wanted to see? Yeah, I, I mostly just would have liked to see, like, a little bit more history, you know? Like, yeah. I feel like... You know, the thing is, basically, we see him from Attack of the Clones to the beginning of Revenge of the Sith. Like, fairly late in Attack of the Clones, I think, right? Like, yeah. not in the very beginning. Um and then throughout the Clone Wars animated show, right? And yeah. there's a lot of episodes of the the animated show, but that's a narrow time frame. It's like seven seasons, but it's like three years or something like that, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's not a, a, a long span of time. So I think not getting any, you know, something that showed like, I don't know, maybe a Dooku backstory. Like they could have done that. They had, you know, 100 to 200 yeah. episodes somewhere in there, right? Like they, they could have gotten a little bit more into that. And maybe maybe through the context of him like telling a story to someone, you know, maybe that episode that was um, where Obi-Wan and Anakin, I think got captured by Hondo and company and then was were imprisoned with Dooku. I do feel like it was just Obi-Wan and Dooku for a moment and then there was Anakin too, but... I'm not sure. Yeah, I think Anakin tried to save Obi Wan and got captured yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's like, just like more yeah. and more people getting captured. But like, I think there maybe they could have, you know, had a little bit more of a slow burn instead of like a lot of action right then of like trying to escape and all that stuff. There could have been some of that, but like he could have been talking about something. He could have been talking about Qui Gon yeah. Jinn, you know, like yeah. and like they could have shown that and. You know, that wasn't really what the show was. They were trying to tell a whole bunch of different stories in that one time period. But I think that would have been a great opportunity, you know, to yeah. to kind of go back and, and give just, – just give some more depth to this character, you know, who it was – it felt like there was a lot of implied depth, but there wasn't mm -hmm. a lot of explicit depth. And I just would have liked to see more of that. Like, to me, it's funny. Um, one, of, one of the first things I would love to see is just, you know, that moment where the two of them are alone – and Dooku saying to, to Obi-Wan, tell me about how Qui-Gon died. Mm. You know, just mm -hmm. like them beginning to connect for that moment about like, yeah, they both really cared about this person. Yeah. Um, I will say also in, you also could have done it a lot in the conversations between Dooku and Ventress. Because sure. uh, it's a little bit annoying sometimes, but the, the, the storytelling conceit of Dooku Jedi Lost is Ventress is hunting for Dooku's sister. And so to learn more about it, she basically steals all these holocrons in which Dooku wrote letters to his sister. And so, but often it's like Ventress is narrating her watching something where Dooku is narrating <laughs> something where younger Dooku is narrating. It's just like, <laughs> I'm sure that as an audio play or as I think it could be on screen, it works in the script. It's just like, who is telling what? <laughs> so long. But you do really get the sense of that. It's the idea of like, Dooku, Dooku sets it all up for Ventress to find this because he wants he wants to tell her his story of how he fell because this is during those early steps where Ventress hasn't fully committed herself to Dooku yet. Mm. And I think that could have been, yeah, another way to, to, to tell both of their stories in that way. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll take it. Paul, I think you might also like the book Yoda, Dark Rendezvous, um, which is set during the waning days of the Clone Wars. And... The Jedi Council gets a message from Dooku being like, hey, I want to talk with Yoda. I want to talk peace. Mm. Uh, and everybody's like, well, this is clearly a trap, right? right, right. Everybody's like, yeah, this is a trap. And Yoda's like, I'm Yoda. <laughs> I can I can win. Right, he's like, uh, oh, so I'm good. Don't worry about me. Yoda walks in and, like, the first thing he says to Dooku is like, okay, tell me your side. Turn me to the dark side. That's why mm. we're both here, right? you want to turn me to the dark side. Duke is like, kind of, yeah. <laughs> Let's see if I can convince you. Yoda's like, you're not going to be able to, but imagine if you did. And there's this great moment where Yoda has his Galadriel moment being like, if you turn me right. to the dark side, <laughs> you would not even be a consideration for an apprentice. I would rule the galaxy. I'd love to, I'd love to read that. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and then after du Dooku gets to the point where he's like, okay, I'm not going to convince you. Now it's your turn. Convince me to return. Mm. And Yoda goes into it and is like, let's talk about your experience as my Padawan. What caused you to leave the Jedi Order? 
it's been a while since I've read that book, but I think it really does dig into Dooku's psyche a little bit more. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. That. I'll I'll yeah. watch that. I mean, I, I don't know if I'll read it, but... <laughs> At yeah. some point, no. I'll have a podcast episode on it. It'll probably be like 30, 40 minutes. That'll be nice and short. Perfect. That's that's. I yeah. like to go for walks about that long. That'll be excellent. Yeah, yeah Paul, I think you especially would really appreciate Archives Are, are Incomplete because it, it really is like, I, I don't... There are just oh. so many writers in the Legends canon who don't understand this weird foreign concept called women mm-hmm. um, and just can't write a non-male character to save their lives. Yeah. And so having you explain them, Jonah, is often much preferable. <laughs> Yeah. I did read I all mean, of Lord of the Rings, so you know I might be able to successfully oh navigate said books. But well, their women just don't appear. Right, so they, they just don't, don't worry exist. About not knowing how to read women. <laughs> yeah, but most of the episodes are twenty to forty minutes, as long as we discount Darth Plagueis. Mm-hmm. Right, right. But that's one of the best books there is, and and, and it's yeah. so dense, and it covers so much time. It's yeah. beautiful, mm-hmm. and I love it, and I talk about it for two and a half hours. Nice. Yeah. Well, it's, we cover well, that I, here I, too, right? Yeah, while, yeah, we did an episode on it, yeah. and and I think it, a lot of the understandings that I have of Dooku from Legends comes from that because you get to watch first Plagueis and then Sidious like slowly planting these ideas in Dooku's head. Yeah. I just really enjoy watching the Sith play the long game with literally anybody. Mm-hmm. It's great to because so many of them are master manipulators. Are we good for Kenobi spoilers? Here. Yeah, I think we can do spoilers for the show, Kenobi. It's been long enough uh, at this point. Vader with Third Sister just being like, I know what you... Like, I have understood from mm. day one exactly yeah. what you were doing. You weren't in control ever. Right. And, like, that's just so par for the course for Sith. And it's really cool to see Vader do something other than, I have a lightsaber and am very strong. Let's fight. Which I do think is always one of the most int- – it's a little bit paradoxical, but it, it makes sense if you hold these things in tension. I think it's one of my favorite parts of some of the Sith is this idea of they are willing to act out of emotion and to give freedom to their passions. That's literally in their creed. But also because of that, they understand the emotions of others yeah. and can manipulate people so well it's, on the – It's terrible and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess that's part of why I wanted that is I want the level of like – Dooku having this very genuine feeling that he wants and and then and then Sidious manipulating it. And it may just be that like we just don't that you're right, that is kind of the story given, we just don't see more of it. Yeah. Like one thing I find interesting, and maybe it's because they they did a version of this in in Revenge of the Sith and they didn't land it, uh, at least as I see it. But from what I can tell, not anywhere on screen, not in any of the legend stuff I've read, and not in any of the canon stuff I've read the Disney stuff that I've read. You never actually get the scene where Dooku swears allegiance to Sidious or where he he decides to fully give himself to the dark side. What you generally get is this character who is, I'm leaving the Jedi. I think the Jedi are wrong about some of the dark side. I'm going to flirt with those powers. And this guy named Sidious seems like he has some good ideas. And then he shows up five years later as Darth Tyrannus. So... Part of me, I agree that I have not seen that anywhere, and part of me thinks that's because it didn't happen. That, yeah, that that <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty compelling case for it doesn't exist, unless it's in uh, some of the comics somewhere, I guess, or the young mm-hmm. adult things. Because like part of, well, as I was saying, way. not a true Sith, right. um, and but he is Darth Tyrannus. I mean, something he, happened to make sure, him Darth Tyrannus. He gets the title, um, but I there's a lot of evidence in the Legends canon books that Sidious never considered Tyrannus to be a true apprentice, similar to how he never considered Maul to be a true apprentice. He's not like, you're not you're not going to be my heir. You're right. not going to be the next right. Sith champion. He, he thinks of him he's as a like place a placeholder, soldier, right? Almost. Right. right. He, he, he's a placeholder till, yeah, because first he wanted an assassin like Maul, and now he wants a political manipulator until right. Anakin's old enough. Right. Right. And so I don't think, like... Dooku takes on the name, right? He mm-hmm. takes on the name Darth Tyrannus. But everybody still calls him Count Dooku. That's true. He Like, that's yeah. not his identity. Well, he doesn't identify as Darth Tyrannus. He identifies as Count Dooku, also known as Darth Tyrannus on Reddit. But, <laughs> that's like I mean, but 90, yeah. 99% of people call him, you know, Darth, uh, Count, uh, call him Chancellor Palpatine. They don't call him Darth Sidious. 
that's because his identity isn't out. Whereas Tyrannus's identity is yeah, public, I think. Right? Like, people don't know that Emperor Palpatine is Darth Sidious, aside from, like, I, a few Jedi, but, like, most of them are dead. I thought most of the Separatist leaders don't know that he's a Sith Lord. Or at least most of the Separatist people. Uh, my impression was they... I mean, they saw the red lightsaber and they're able to put two and two together. Um, and, like, if the Jedi know... If, I feel like that became very public knowledge at the end of Attack of the Clones anyway. Maybe mm-hmm. before it, it wasn't. But it, compared to when Palpatine is discovered, like, then the Jedi Order is annihilated and yeah. the Republic becomes the Empire, you know? So it seems like yeah. there's going to be a lot more suppression of information there. Yeah. I don't know. And that may also go to the point, because kind of, I hear what you're saying, uh, Jonah, that... Like, the way the Separatist cause is set up, they're never really given a sensible motive, so it wouldn't make sense for uh, si- for Tyrannus to actually believe in it, for Dooku to believe in it. To me, th- like, I think that's another big oh, problem. Sure. The Separatists are never actually given a real motive. I think part oh, of... no, they have a real motive. They are trillionaires, and they don't have enough money. That's their motive. But, like, that's a small number of them, right? I mean, most of the... It's, aren't yeah, there a I mean, bunch like, of systems that are... It's not just the ruling class that supports it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are... Like, if you remember the scene in Clone Wars when, like, they go to the Separatist Senate, like, there are clearly... Syst- and you can say that this is in the same way that billionaires manipulate things in our own world. Like, you can say that there this is manipulation, but certainly some of them clearly believe that, the wor- that their worlds would be better off, not richer, but just better off if they separate from the corruption... But it, it, I feel like this part of the story is very incoherent. And I, and I mean, wish they had given us more clear motivation for the Separatists. I think what they see is the Republic, the Republic's attempt to control these entities is more taxes and regulation. And the companies have enough lawyers and buy in the Senate to avoid those regulations. And so these smaller planets keep on getting slammed with more taxes and more regulation and they're not allowed they lose freedom over time and that's what frustrates them they're like we want to leave the republic and the corporate entities are also like dodging these regulations is also tiresome we also want to leave the republic we'll bankroll the insurrection right i mean and certainly yeah a lot of them like, even Dooku at one point, said, he says that one of the worst parts of the corruption of the Republic is that they've let the Trade Federation act as though it's a planet. You know, they've given sort of political power to these corporations and stuff like right. that. Right. Like, they have actual senatorial seats from the Trade Fed, which is like, oh, can you imagine the 100 second or 100 first and 100 second seats going to, in the Senate, going to Amazon? <laughs> Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> I mean, that would just be making official what's already, like, you know. Right, but it yeah. would, but I mean, it would be, I think there's something to be said for, like, this isn't explicitly the way things are supposed to be. Yeah. There's a, this is the idea, and then the idea is corrupted, compared to just yeah. like, right. yeah, we're just going to totally, I mean, there is legalized bribery, right? I mean, there's unlimited yeah. um, corporate contributions, right? But, like... Yeah. You know, that yeah, it's is not official. Right. I mean, that is fundamentally different from just like, yes, every, you know, S&P 500 company gets one seat, you know. Right. And like that would be even worse, I think. The coal companies have to go through the process of buying a Senator Joe Manchin. They can't just have yeah, that person exactly. show up. They, yeah. Yes. They don't officially. Yeah. 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 And, and that's just all I'm saying is that I think like I think especially in the show and the movies, but a little bit in the books, I think sometimes they're trying to have it both ways with the separatists and that they are to some extent trying to say this is just corporate people wanting corporate things and there's no legitimacy to their cause, but then sometimes wanting to say that there are some people who have some legitimate concerns. And I think certainly in some of the books, in Legends and in Disney, they try to make those things more legitimate. And I just think it winds up all coming out somewhat incoherent. And I just wish that that had been... I mean, also because on the other side, like, part of the thing I never actually learn is what's wrong with them separating? Like, right, right. You know, if a bunch of people are like, cool, nice republic, we don't want to be part of it anymore. Like, it's never explained why that's a huge problem in any way. And granted, it's because, like, this. you can listen to my episode on Attack of the Clones, and this is my larger critique of, like, 
they're trying to put these very complicated, nuanced, in-depth political questions into the movie that's supposed to be even more explicitly for kids than the original movies, right? which is not a good fit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's one thing. I, I think Dooku's story would have been helped a lot more if we'd had much clearer motivations and, and at least some degree of understandable motivations for the, for the separatists. Maybe a Disney Plus series. I mean, I've... What is it? Um, I Somebody pitched uh, bringing Jimmy Smiths and just doing a West Wing series <laughs> of Senator from Alderaan. Just... I'd be down. Ha- yeah, like, I'd love it. I mean, he, he was elected president. Yeah. So, he, like, he fits the role. I'd right. absolutely watch... Well, especially because, like, like his daughter's, his, his, like, the Organa family, because his daughter's going to be bouncing around doing something during that time. Yeah. And we've got a pretty good actress who can play her. And in the books, at least, um, their mother, I think her name is pronounced Brea, I forget, but in the, in the Disney canon books, they actually go, they, they actually finally explain one of the questions that I never fully understood, which I think was also explained in Legends, of, like, how is she a princess and the child of a senator? Right, right. And it's that the senator is the consort of the queen, um, but the character of the queen is actually quite well fleshed out in some of the books about uh, young Leia, which I really appreciate. That's interesting. I can't remember if Brea is a legend's name or not. Uh, I'm going to look up what the name is while we keep talking about other things. This is a random deep cut, but Bria, B-R-I-A, is one of Han's girlfriends in Legends canon. And so I want, if it's, if Brea isn't the legend's name, maybe Brea... Brea is a nod to Bria by somebody who's <laughs> equally large of a nerd. Oh, mm-hmm. here's another deep cut while you're looking that up. In Kenobi, when they're going through the safe house, there's um, a quick scratching on one of the walls that says something along the lines of Quinlan was here, yeah. or maybe Obi-Wan says that. That's a reference to Quinlan Voss, who was a Jedi who was apprenticed to Count Dooku for a period of time during the Clone Wars. So... It's all relevant. Everything's tied right. together. Which which is interesting because uh, w- w- I don't know the exact order it will come out. I think after this episode, there's an episode that will probably come out on this podcast, but it might have already come out, where we're going to discuss the book Dark Disciple, mm. which is about Quinlan Voss and Asajj Ventress teaming up to try and kill Dooku, and that there being some level of, like, to fight the dark side, you're going to have to <sighs> use the dark side. And it's one, it, it is in the Disney canon, so it is verboten to Jonah, I know. But if I can ever get to read one book, I'd say read this one because no, no, no. It's, it's one of the best explorations of the dark side that I've ever read. The reason I'm upset is because they're disrupting the fundamental tenets as laid out by Darth Bane. Like, Asajj Ventress teaming up with somebody else to take down her master. That is verboten. That but you're she's not already... Supposed- she was never one of the two, right? I mean... I mean, so the two is everybody breaks the rule of two <laughs> by having one apprentice, but you're not supposed to take your apprentice to team up against your master. Right. Um, you're supposed they, to have your apprentice kind of in the wings already. And so, like, that's why Darth Vader says something like, you know, join me and together right. we can, yeah. you know. But you're yeah. supposed to, but, but Jonah, to your point, the book makes clear this is after Dooku has kicked her out. Mm. She's no longer a Sith, and she's clearly talking about, like, She's now kind of in the place that Dooku was before, where she's like, I don't want to be a Sith. I don't want to be just, like, mindless violence. But, like, there's some cool tricks. I, I don't want to take the, the dark side arrows out of my quiver. Right. right. And a lot of it's, like, her teaching Quinlan how to use some of those dark side arrows without fully going to the dark side. Uh, it's fascinating to me when Jedi start tapping into the dark, because they're just like, why? The Jedi are too restrictive. However, those restrictions, like, many people can survive tapping into the dark side a little bit. And many people who, if they're corrupted, can come back. However, if nobody breaks this restriction, nobody falls to the dark side. And that's what the Jedi are aiming for. But... Well, and that's why I say it's kind of like the just say no to drugs idea. Because it's like... The idea that no one's ever going to want a toy with this is kind of ridiculous. And it creates the idea that if you try it once... And nothing bad happens, you have no one to talk to about it. I mean, now I have the idea of, like, safe spaces for Jedi trainees where they're like, okay, and in this room, you go to the dark side for an hour. (laughs) 
Just, I, do you want to try Force Lightning? We have an expert. Uh, I, like, I mean, this is, forgive me, I'm not going to go into this one, because but Jonah, Jonah's heard this before. Yeah. But but that's kind of my, like, um, Anakin needed the, the metaphorical equivalent of safer sex in that, like, in, in communities where there's no sex education given, people get naturally curious, and if there's no place to go, they go to the internet, or they go to that nice older man who's willing to talk to them about it, and is you know, all the problems that can happen. And I think that's exactly what happens to Anakin. No one will talk to him about the feelings he's having, except this nice older man who clearly has the best of intentions for him. <laughs> um, hence my idea, you know, so Dooku is just say no, Anakin is better sex education. Yeah, I mean, I think the Jedi would have done better with less extremism. Who yeah. would have thought that less extremism might be a good idea? Yeah. It, it, it's one of the things I think I'm liking most about the High Republic books is the High Republic books are a time where there's much less extremism and there's much more sort of like, you know, kind of like, yeah, okay, if you have like a friends with benefits every now and then, it's fine. Just don't get attached. And That's... One of the things that I love about the post-original trilogy Legends books, because it's Luke Skywalker being like, right, okay, the Jedi Order. I read a book about a journal about a book of the Jedi Order, and also Obi-Wan said some stuff to me in the ten minutes I knew him. All right, <laughs> let me draw an elephant. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> he knows that there's a trunk and four legs, and that's all he's got. Yeah. Um... I mean, I think in many ways, Kanan Jarrus in Rebels is that exact same thing. Uh, yeah, and yeah. that's why he's like, yeah, I have an, I'm a Jedi. I also have a wife. Yeah. And I love her dearly. And I love my kids, even even Chopper. Uh, you know, and like like Yoda would think Kanan was a horrible Jedi. And Kanan's, I think, one of the best we get. Uh, what I think is the best about Luke's Jedi in the books, at the very least, is that he's like, yep, you will face temptation and you can come back. I think that's the biggest problem. Oh, this is fun. Uh, the biggest problem with the Jedi is that they don't have a uh, rescue mechanism, right? right? If you go to the dark side, they're like, well, you're gone forever. We'll try yeah. to redeem you, but you're not going to be saved. So we'll just lock you in a little box and say bye. Um, whereas Luke's Jedi are like, oh, you fell to the dark side. Yeah, I did that too. I blew up a system. Whoops. And people are like, how many people did you kill? And he's like, couple million and you're like oh so you do understand these feelings of guilt that i'm having because i accidentally hurt somebody he's like yeah except i intentionally <laughs> genocided i'm better now i'm no longer genocidal <laughs> <I'm better now. laughs> Re uh, that's kip genocider that's kip duran he committed genocide i was sith uh, i got better <laughs> i i do yeah. think that there's something to be said for like um you know, like the idea of of just say no or like abstaining from something completely can be the best solution for some people. You know, right? But the Forcing acknowledgement it on that it's not the best solution for all people, and that different right, yeah. people need different tools, basically, to avoid um, you know doing horrible things or or not even horrible things, but just like things they don't want to do, right? right. And and so, and the Jedi are like, this is the one way. And it's like, well, that, that way might work great for some people. But, like, yeah. if you regard it as the one true way, like, that's, it's not going to work for everybody. And, and things, things might get out of hand. Right. Like, for me, abstaining from things works. I didn't buy Lego for years. <laughs> right. And then I got access to some <laughs> Lego. And I spent a ton of money on Lego in the course of a year. I got multiple Star Destroyers yeah. in a year. And I, and now I'm going to just be, like, not spending money on Lego. Because it's so easy to just be like, oh, yeah, I'll get that. That's affordable for now. As long as I don't spend any money next month. And I'm like, well, this one's affordable as long as I don't spend any money next month. Right, right. Uh, right. Yeah. Or, like, how I played World of Warcraft. Like, I could play for eight hours, or I could play for zero hours. Right, right. I could not play for 30 minutes. Yeah. There is no world where I could log on, do one quest, and log off. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm very much the same way, where there's a lot of things where I'm just like, I will just simply not do this at all, and that's yeah. fine. But yeah. if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it a lot, you know? I'm going to fall to the dark side. Right. Like, yeah. you know, I didn't play any chess games for a number of years, because I knew that it like specifically <laughs> there's there's a there's a chess site Lee, Lee Chess where you can do yeah. unlimited tactics right for with a free account 
I specifically went years without signing up there because I knew I could go to chess.com and only do like five or six free puzzles a day. And that was it. Mm. And I couldn't do yeah. any more. And so I just did that. And that was like, it was just very contained. And while that is a small amount, it's like, that was the maximum amount. So it was like, okay, I did my maximum. Yeah. And that's it. It's that's over. one of the great things about Wordle. Oh, is that, that it's like one, the thing. one It is one puzzle. You do it, you're done. Right. And you're not like, here's another, here's another, here's another. Yeah. And you don't get burned out. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think it's very true. I think I think yeah, that's something that like in these books we're talking about, and also in some of the High Republic books, that they're really exploring that like different ideas of like is it better to sort of let you know like what are you giving up, or to have like some idea of like because I think one of the things that's most interesting about the Jedi and 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 the Sith, and this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's connected to all this, is that like to me there's a fundamental difference between you cannot have attachments that are so strong that you become emotionally invested in them and unable to keep a place of balance versus you have to be Spock and you right. cannot feel passion. And in the same way also that like you cannot be so attached to someone that you lose your, your, your perspective becomes you have to be totally celibate and you can't have strong emotional feelings and you have to be totally emotionally neutral to the idea of this person dying, uh, looking at you, Luminara, um, like, and, and I think that's part of the, like, part of what I'm liking so much about the High Republic is that, and I think some of the, also this Dooku novel gets into this a lot, is that, like, y by the time of the Clone Wars, and especially the time before it, and, and Yoda especially, like, Yoda's kind of an extremist in terms of how much oh, he very, wants very the, the limitations, and that, like, he wasn't always, and that, you know, history is often, like, like cultural mores are often formed by, like, Things went one way and then they went, as some people think, too far that way. And so there's a backlash and society swings all the other way and then back and forth. Thinking that the Jedi have always been these aesthetes, uh, aesthetics, you know, it doesn't work as much as understanding that, like, part of what was so tragic about Anakin is, like, in most of the other parts of Jedi history, I think Anakin would have been okay. I think people would have been like, yeah, you're sad about losing your mother. We don't want that to take you over and, like, not all Tuscan babies killed your mother. So let's talk to you about that and process your feelings. But you don't have to be afraid of them. Right. Yeah. Right. Here's a question. So there's – this was a practice, I believe, by the Spartans in ancient Greece and the Unsullied in Game of Thrones where as part of your training you raised a puppy or some animal and then at the end of your training – you had to go through the process of killing that animal to break yourself of that emotional connection and learn to distance yourself and work through that grief. Um, and I'm curious, I mean, the Jedi wouldn't be like, we're going to have puppies and then murder them because that's evil. But I'm curious if, what if the Jedi Order had a process in which they're like, we're going to, like, part of your training is finding your best friend and then we're going to say hey you and your best friend are going to go to different planets for five years and you're not going to be able to see each other and you're not you're going to have limited contact and you're going to have to deal with that loss and make that a part of regular training so that everybody has to deal with that sort of loss and you have your jedi master is there to be like talk to me about your feelings mm. what are you feeling you're angry at us for separating them right you should be right here's how you accept that anger and don't let that affect your actions. And I think that would have been good for the Jedi. Or they could just pretend that feelings don't exist. Either or. Either way. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think I think there's some value to that. Like, I don't... Uh, and I think some Jedi go through that where, like, your Padawan, your, your master as a Padawan is basically your parental figure. And then some, like, they stick together, like Obi-Wan and, and Anakin, but others, they're just immediately separated. Um, one another book that I want, some might want to do a full episode on, but Brotherhood is a really great book about Obi Wan and Anakin, and a lot of it's about the um, the time. It, it's about it basically starts right when Anakin has become a Jedi Knight, and it's the beginning of the Clone Wars, and so they're both talking about like how do we feel about being generals, and unsurprisingly, Obi Wan's a lot more hesitant about it, and Anakin's like, yeah, let's come on, we're fighting for good and justice. This is great. Um, but one of the things it brings up also is that Obi-Wan is aware 
that Anakin is still struggling because Anakin had these strong emotional connections, especially to his mother, that he had to let go of. And Obi-Wan realizes he can't connect with Anakin about that because he didn't have that. He was his first memories of are the crash at the Jedi Temple. And so he has no memory of like what it's like to have an emotional connection and then have to give it up. And and yeah, I think you're right. Like all the versions I can think of sound like child abuse, and so I don't want to do them. Yeah. But also the idea that like if everyone had some understanding of what it means if all the masters had a memory of giving up an attachment, at least I feel like they could be a lot better in helping their Padawans deal with the process of giving up attachment. Because I I mean I, I don't think it's coincidental that at least in the Disney canon, both Anakin and Dooku had an emotional connection to someone from their family that they were having trouble giving up and that their masters couldn't understand. Speaking of child abuse, taking kids away from their families and not letting them ever interact with their parents ever seems not great. So the Jedi don't really have strong opinions about not committing child abuse, apparently. So like, but also Also here's an idea. What if you just had a bunch of therapists and just let Jedi talk to therapists? (laughs) You were, that... you, you were apparently listening to our Rebels episode that we recorded yesterday, but it come out about a week before that. Because, yeah, that was the, like, at least, like, Deanna Troy has terrible boundaries. She's a bad therapist. But at least get her on the, you know, get get some Deanna Troys or maybe even some real therapists somewhere. Um, but, Matthew, you and I talked about this um, a couple days ago in a chat that we were having. Uh, I think it was us. Uh, about Nija Halcyon, uh, who is a Jedi Knight possibly a master i think a jedi master during the clone wars and he's sent to the same planet that anakin is sent to at a time and at one point nija senses a weakness in anakin we're really far off from dooku but this is connected i'm sure yeah Um, i'm gonna pull us back after this and we're gonna start wrapping up but and nija realizes that anakin's going through something is feeling lost and is scared of losing somebody he's like oh yeah I also have a wife, so, like, that's a thing that I can help you work through emotionally. And Anakin's like, sorry, you're a Jedi and you have a wife? That's a thing you can do? And he's like, no, you can't as long as... But you can as long as nobody knows. <laughs> Just keep it secret, keep it safe, it'll be fine. And talk to me if you have anything... Like, if you want to talk to somebody. I've been through what you've been through. It's not easy. And I would, like... What would have happened if he'd gotten... Nietzsche as a master instead of Obi-Wan mm-hmm. if he'd had more access or if the Jedi, you know, talked about their feelings ever instead of suppressing them. Mm-hmm. Anyways, back to Dooku. Sounds like it would have been well, constructive. I, mean, I think that ties in perfectly to Dooku in some ways because actually, again, right. in, the, in the Disney canon, Paul, so Joan and I have been, like, rambling and telling stories back and forth. What, what's kind of your take on this? Are you kind of like, uh, is this giving you more insight into Dooku from a perspective? Or kind of what, what? I mean... You say something. It was. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, like, you know, we're talking about talking about your feelings, which I think is a good thing, you know. Um, but, and I, I, in a way, I don't feel like Dooku's a character who feels like he didn't have that, right? I don't know how mm-hmm. old he was when he went to the Jedi Order, but it sounds like he did actually he, have connections with his family. So, at least in Disney, I think there's a different legend. In Disney, he's abandoned as a baby. Oh, and part of it's because he's, like, in part because maybe the history that Jonah was talking about, like, their planet hates the Jedi, kind of oh, like the Mandalorians okay. yeah. do. And his father, like, literally, like, called up the Jedi and said, you'll find my son outside my door, closed the door, left the baby outside where there were wolves, and was like, have fun. And then the baby, um, and like, then, force choked the wolves or something? or what, what? I, Something like that. And then, like, over time... He wound up running into his family and like developing this secret connection with his sister. Okay. But yeah, he so he built a connection, but yeah, he was he started as a baby in the Jedi Temple. I see, I see. Interesting. In That's Legends different. Canon, uh, he was given to the Jedi by his family. And they're like, Yeah, we have another son who can be our heir. You can have this one because he's strong in the force. And he was as a child, like of five, he was aware of his family mm. uh, and knew that they had given him to the Jedi. Oh, okay. Right. I feel like that would so, create some feelings, you know? Uh, he felt driven to prove himself worthy mm-hmm. of his origins. He's like, I am 
a noble of Sereno. Mm. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I am superior to all of these other Padawans. I will prove myself. Right. Um, it wasn't a feeling of an abandonment because he still had that connection to his family. Right. And they're like, we're proud of you. Do your best. And he's like, I will. So I remember the, ca- the character that I was trying to find who's mentioned in both the book Master and Apprentice, uh, but also mentioned a good, which is about uh, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, but is also mentioned in the one I just talked about, Dooku Jedi Lost, is uh, I think it's pronounced Rail Averloss. Uh, and he was Dooku's first Padawan before uh, Qui-Gon. And he's very much like the first time that Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan meet him, like they come to his chambers late at night and he's got a naked woman in his bed. And and Qui-Gon is like, like Obi-Wan expects him to be like, you're th- we're throwing you out of the order. And Qui-Gon still is it's like, oh, Barney, you're up to your old ways. You know, like <laughs> it's very much like just just don't let people see, you right, know. Right. And so I think it's, again, that very much more permissive mm-hmm. and um, you know, and, and Rael is very much like and and Dooku quite literally like like. He thinks of Rael as kind of like a lovable scamp. You know, right. he, he's very proud of him, even if he doesn't do what the Jedi often want him to do. Right. So I think uh, we can kind of start wrapping up. I wanted to do some last couple of questions. And we did get one question from a, a fan who wrote in, I remember hearing after episode two came out that Dooku killed sifo and took his identity and placed the order for the clones. This is obviously retconned by Clone, War- retconned by Clone Wars. Would it have been a better story? Dooku kills his friend as his final Sith initiation and then furthers a grand plan using his identity? Sure. I don't know. That, that works for me. It makes more sense than what I got in the context of the Clone Wars TV series. You know, I, not necessarily makes more sense than, than the things that I didn't read. But, like, you know, I think that would be an interesting story that would have made coherent sense. Mm-hmm. I think that that makes a more coherent story given the shows and movies as your source. I think with the comics and the books, they fill out a lot of that in-between space. And so Mm. you don't... I don't necessarily think that's a better story if you're looking at all of the content. But also there's a ton of content. And so reading all of these comics and reading all of the books to get that story yeah could have been simplified a little bit but then again part of why i like star wars is because it's so expansive right yeah and, and to some extent i do think i mean just and uh this came from james harding by the way i'm not saying that james is wrong here but i think some of this does actually happen in that he's saying like would it have been like a sith initiation for dooku to kill his friend and then impersonate him i think what happens is that Sifo Dyas very much under the influence of not like mind control, but like you know good like manipulation to certainly places the order, and then I think the Clone Wars does establish that Dooku has him killed, mm. and I think I I like the idea that maybe that is kind of one of Sidious's like real tests of loyalty, you know like because certainly uh, even more so in the canon books, but even even in um, I think some of the legend stuff, it is established that Sifo Dyas and Dooku were quite close, that mm. they were Padawans together, that they were. Uh, initiates to get younglings together. And I think to your point, Paul, I remember when the name sifo was first mentioned, the fact that I didn't have any idea who it was was very frustrating. Yeah. And I feel like if we had had... I just think Dooku is a much more interesting character before he becomes Darth Tyrannus. Hmm. And I think yeah. if we'd gotten a lot more of him before he's Darth Tyrannus, but especially if we'd seen him have this friendship with sifo yeah, then that would have made all the stuff that happens with sifo and Dooku getting him killed have a lot more power. I think his Sith alignment is the least interesting thing about him. And so yeah. having the story be about betrayal and fully committing to the Sith personally i find that a less compelling story because that's not what's interesting about him it's about his manipulative tactics and his intelligence and his beliefs right for me yeah one especially because that could also be like if i go more to the in her region you're talking about jonah like i think another fun way of story would be give us a movie of like Dooku insidious like being like yeah we're working together we're working together and both of them thinking that they're getting one over on the other mm, yeah. you know yeah. and that we pretty much know in the end Sidious actually held the upper hand but that it's that kind of like we're, we're both claiming to be allies we're both working with these machinations but that like you know 
you know, Tyrannus is working in two, di- you know, he's playing three dimensional chess and uh, Palpatine is playing four dimensional chess. Right. So any other kind of last things that you all want to wrap up with? Paul, any other kind of last questions or thoughts about, about this character? I, I was just going to say, give me an alternate timeline where, like, Dooku, like, off Sidious, and, like, I'll watch that. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I know everybody's probably burnt out on multiverses, but that's... I mean, here's my what if. What mm-hmm. if on uh, the Invisible Hand or whatever CIS ship it was at the beginning of Revenge of the Sith, when Anakin has Dooku at his mercy, Dooku's like, that guy over there is the Sith Lord you're looking for. That's Sidious. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Just yeah, like, kill me there. if you want, but I'm here for the Separatist cause, not his. <laughs> Just do a quick read. And if he shows up in the Force and you get a dark side sense from him, maybe you arrest him. Uh, that would have been neat. That's the what if I want. That's beautiful also because Obi-Wan's unconscious then. Yeah. And so if you now spend the rest of that movie with Anakin remembering that and Anakin being tempted by Palpatine, but also remembering what Dooku said and Obi-Wan is no, oh, that would have been so much better. And like, if, if the story continues the way it is and he kills Dooku, fine. But if he listens and he's like, I'm going to arrest both of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that could be great. And, and yeah, my, my what if is just, I just would have liked, I, I think Attack of the Clones is a great movie if Count Dooku isn't Darth Tyrannus yet. Mm. Like, I think that just makes it such a better movie. And the Clone Wars... And if if the Clone Wars is the story of Count Dooku slowly falling more and more to the dark side and becoming Darth Tyrannus, I would love that. I, so. I think is a great movie if is a strong statement, but... <laughs> yes. <laughs> is is a mean, better movie. I'll, I'll, you know... Some romance scenes need to be rewritten rather dramatically i will say i rewatched that before kenobi fast forwarding through a good half of the movie and there are mm-hmm. definitely good parts and um you know the just the 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 interplay between kenobi and dooku is is there's some good stuff in there you know yeah and i think he just tells obi-wan that he's like oh a sith lord is in control of the republic and obi-wan's yeah, like oh does. come on and like hmm that was that was some knowledge he dropped on him and just got no no we're just ignoring yeah. this all right which, which is wonderful because that's a theme because um maul says something i remember maul says something similar yeah exactly maul says something very similar to ahsoka at the end mm. of clone wars and yeah. you know, she's not ready to believe it right yet. yeah so all right well it's been a wonderful discussion thank you both so much for being a part of it um, I knew that the hope that uh, I'm quite happy that we're wrapping it up in about 90 minutes. We are the three, three of the most talkative people who I have on these podcasts. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad we were able to keep it to a, a tight 90. relative uh, tight 90. Exactly. Um, but, you know, people who uh, want to find more about what you all are doing. Jonah, where can they find your podcast? Uh, the Archives Are Incomplete is on most major podcast hosty places like spotify and apple and a couple other places i technically have a twitter account uh, at jedi underscore archive but i use it approximately never Mm -hmm. uh so okay that yeah i don't exist on the internet so if you have more questions about legend stuff send them to that twitter account and then one day jonah will sign in and feel very loved and so, like, send in the question, and then four months later, out of the blue, you can get a Twitter notification from someone you've completely forgotten about answering your question. It'll, it'll be like Christmas morning. It'll be great. Probably, yeah. Christmas <laughs> is about right if you send it today. Nice. Uh, we will, however, get – I'll make sure there's a link to the Archives Are Incomplete. It's one of my favorite Star Wars podcasts out there. I am learning so much by, by listening to them. Definitely check it out. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I'm Zen Madman on on Twitch and Twitter. I I tweet things mostly about my Twitch and then like chess positions and sometimes about having weird dreams of playing poker with like Jeopardy hosts. I don't know. Um, (laughs) You can find me there and on YouTube as Zen Madman, Zen Madman Poker and Zen Madman Chess. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Check out all that stuff. Um, I've been enjoying a lot of your poker content recently because you've been doing some like going back to some one-on-one fundamentals, but also showing like some of the really incredible internet tools there are in terms of uh, poker solvers that you can use. And uh, it, it trust me, at first it looks like some space age, 
<laughs> Chinese algebra nonsense. But like, listen to Paul for ten minutes, explain it. It makes a lot of sense. And then, if you're a poker player, <clears throat> it's a great way to up your game. Of course, uh, this is being recorded on a Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, thus 8 and 6 in the East and the Mountains. Um, and however, that, like, it's something Greenwich time. Do the math if you're anywhere in the world. It's definitely worth checking out. We love taking listener questions. Uh, we didn't get a chance to do that today, but definitely we'll get you know interaction, stuff like that. And of course, check out all the podcasts. Uh, you can find this podcast as well as the Superhero Ethics Podcast on TheEthicalPanda.com. That's my website. I am The Ethical Panda online. You'll find me a lot of places by just searching for The Ethical Panda. On that website, you'll also find all the ways to contact us, email, Twitter, TikTok, etc. Love to hear your comments. Tell us what you thought. What do you think about Dooku? Did you learn more from this podcast? Do you have more questions you want to have answered? Uh, do you have different interpretations? Or what about all the different what-ifs we suggested? What, what Which of them would be interesting to you? We'd love to hear you talk to us about it. So theethicalpanda.com or just search for The Ethical Panda on Facebook, Twitter, etc. You'll find me. Send us the input and I'll share it with both of these folks and we'll uh, get, get a good conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you to both my hosts. Thank you to all of you for being fans. And as fans, please be good to each other. Kenobi. That's my specialty.